Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is a remarkable opportunity and one I know that will bless you incredibly. Today we have with us on Go Ye Therefore, Patricia Gruitz. People who love her and know her call her Sister Pat. Her heart is for people and she has touched the people in Haiti with the love and the message of Jesus Christ. Please enjoy this time. I know you will be blessed. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. I enjoy being here, honey. This was really a special opportunity that you yes. would come and visit us. Well, I'm just pleased that you wanted me. You said your mom is a minister? Now, let me tell you about my mom. I would love to hear. My mother and my father met at the Champion Spark Plug Company years ago. My mother worked in the uh, office and dad was a superintendent in the other field. and. Um, they caught each other's eye. You know how that goes. Yes. And uh, they started dating, and it got serious, and uh, they talked about getting married, but my mother was Roman Catholic, and she would be till she died. And my father was a Methodist, and he would be till he died. Mm -hmm. You had two strong-willed people, and uh, they had for friends the Watsons that invited them to come to their apartment in Hamtramck, because they all worked in that area, and uh, have a last supper, so to speak, with them. And then they were going to break up. Oh, dear. Because there was no sense. They couldn't go any further. That was just the way it was. So uh, they were sitting on the couch in this living room at the apartment. And my mother was, uh, she loved to read. And on the end table next to her was a little book, and she picked it up and started to look at it. She was not familiar that it was a Bible. Uh, Roman Catholic people did not always have their access to the Bible. You mm -hmm. know that. Not, not against them, it was just the way it was. Sure. And uh, she opened to the book of Ruth and began to read. Don't ask me to follow, not to, to follow you. Don't forbid me from following after you. Your people can be my people. Oh. Your God can be my God. And the Lord do more and ought to me if aught but death separate me from you. There's power in the word of God. Yes. A power we don't understand. A lot of times when we are hit with a problem, a verse of scripture will come to mind and it quickens us. It, uh, it absolutely changes our mind. And we know that is God sending his word to us. When the scripture was written, thy word have I hid in my heart, so I won't sin against you. That has more meaning than we know. God hides his word in our heart. He does, especially when we need it. Mm -hmm. If we are pursuing after God for his will, for comfort, whatever direction or whatever, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit, that great comforter, brings a word to us that settles us down and gives us direction. Well, that's what it did to my mother. Beautiful. And they went home after the dinner and they were to say goodbye. And here my mother was, reciting those scriptures to my father. Hidden Don't ask in me her to follow. heart. Don't ask me not to follow mm. you. Don't. Your God can be my God. Your people will be my people. And nothing but death could separate me from you. And they were married. Beautiful. They were married in the Methodist Church here in Detroit. 1920. That's a long time ago. It is. <laughs> 
a long time ago. Well, when my grandma, Irish Catholic, and the relatives up in northern Michigan, way up in the Keweenaw Peninsula, were informed of what my mother had done. <laughs> You'd have to know Mary Margaret Harrington. <laughs> she put on her hat and her coat and, and got her cousin Jesuit Lawrence Bonville to go with her, and they made a trip to Detroit. And they were going to convert my dad. Now, he didn't know this. Didn't know this until my dad was in, up in his 80s. Mm -hmm. He never told it. But when my dad was 12 years old, his family went to a camp meeting in Topeka, Kansas, Methodist camp meeting. And in that Methodist camp meeting, evidently at that time, my father met the Lord. He was 12. When they went home, Grandma had Grandma and Grandpa had a big two hundred and some acre farm, and the kids were of a mind to hold church service, so they held their own service on Sunday afternoon. And all of a sudden, <laughs> the Holy Spirit fell on my dad, and he couldn't speak a word of English. My. It poured out of him, and he began to run. He was frightened with it. And his brothers and sisters, and there were nine boys in that family and one girl. They chased him all over the farm. Oh my. <laughs> and he threatened them with their life if they told it. Uh, and he never told it. Incredible. But we didn't know that was going on. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't understand later on. Mama didn't understand why Daddy was so adamant about that. He was not turning Catholic. He was not being anything but Methodist. He didn't tell her about the Holy Ghost. He never mm. told any of us. Mm. He didn't tell it till he was in his 80s. Incredible. <laughs> Incredible. Bullheaded English, you oh, know. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and German. <laughs> well, anyway. So how did that impact your life, Sister Pat? Well, let me finish my story. Yes, ma'am. up a little bit yes, more here. Grandma came. The Jesuit Lawrence came and Daddy couldn't be converted, mm -hmm. so the family disowned her. Oh dear. It was a bad, serious yeah. time. So my mother was very, very weird, wounded. <laughs> Didn't know what to do. So there was a little Methodist church down the street from where we lived. And my brother Jim and I, who were just a year and 10 months apart, mm -hmm. Mother took us down there to put us in Sunday school, but she would not go in that church. <laughs> the Catholics didn't do that in Methodist churches of any kind. Mm -hmm. Mama was still a very devout Catholic person. She loved the Lord. And week after week, she took us to Sunday school. But she never went in. She'd sit in the lobby. This particular Sunday, one of the ushers said to her, Mrs. Beale, come on in. We're not having church today. Our pastor's gone to a meeting. We're going to get a new minister. Come on in. It's just a business meeting. My mother thought, well, this couldn't hurt. <laughs> so she went in, and they were talking about uh, getting a new minister. And one wanted to good it with youth. One wanted somebody that took care of the elderly. Somebody could sing. Somebody could do this, do this. You know how it goes. And Mother listened. She said, my God, this is awful. Now, we get priests to come to our church, and we, have, we reverence them. We don't have this kind of thing going on in our church. She didn't tell that to anybody. That was what she was thinking. So she got up, took her purse, was getting ready to leave, and she heard the voice of the Lord. They don't need to seek a preacher. They need to seek me. Tell them. She said, I will not. Oh, my. And it came again, and her heart began to beat. Mm -hmm. And she looked at the crowd that was there, not a big crowd, but business people. He said, you don't need to seek a preacher. 
You need to seek him. And with that, she made her way to that altar, and so did many more. Incredible. And when she got up from that altar, she had peace. Mm -hmm. All of the turmoil was gone, and there was peace. Mm -hmm. She brought, came home. I can still remember her dragging Jim and I <laughs> by the hands, running down the street to tell my father what mm. had happened. Oh. Harry, I'm not going to hell, she said. <laughs> he said, who told you you were? Mm. She said, I've known it. Oh well, my. Mama became an evangelist. You had, would have had to know Mama. She had my l little brother Harry in a wagon, and she'd go from neighbor to neighbor to tell the story. That's beautiful. And then they started a church. And they wanted her to be involved with the women. And she was. But she knew she needed something more. She tried to read the Bible and couldn't understand it. She'd get up early in the morning before Dad went to work, light the oven in the kitchen, the way we used to do. We didn't have furnaces and thermostats like today. And sit there with her Bible by the oven and try to make sense out of it. And she could feel the, a draft. Where in the world is that draft coming from? It's cold. She looked around, nothing was open. She went back and started to read again. The power of God came on her. Oh my. And she could mm -hmm. not speak a word of English. She was filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, that power settled it. And she knew she had to tell it. Mm -hmm. And so she told it. And the Methodist Church didn't want to embrace that. They turned to be a different denomination. And Mama didn't know what to do. And so with the friends that she had, that knew she had something from God, they collected their money together. It was during Depression time. And rented a building where they had galvanized tires. And that was the beginning of Bethesda Tabernacle, she called it. And it filled up, and people came and got saved. That's beautiful. And people came and got delivered. People that had an addiction to alcohol and other bad things, and they were delivered. And it grew, and it grew, and it grew. And Mama had a thousand kids in her Sunday school. Oh, thank God. And the church became big. Well, then one mother, <laughs> she knew there needed to be something more. And she said to me, Pat, something's missing here. Something is missing. Pray with me that God will show us what. Well, then I had a meeting with God. I won't go into all that detail, but wow. I had a lot of questions in my mind about the reality of God. A lot of, I never expressed it. But I knew I was never born again. Because when you're born again, there's a change. And when there's not a change, you food in yourself. You've not been born again. Mm. You become a believer. But to be born again is to be born again. A change, a complete change. Well, I hadn't had it. And I longed for it, but I never expressed my need. And one Sunday, after service, all of the people of the church went to the altar. You all went to the altar to talk to God, which you heard in the service. And if you didn't go, there were people that watched you and that was a sign you were backslid. <laughs> so everybody went to the altar, including me. And I was there kneeling, and all of a sudden, mm -hmm. the Spirit of God came on me. And I heard these words r going through my whole being. I thought my chest would explode. And I heard, thou too shall conceive and bear the Christ. Oh. <laughs> all will say, what has happened to you? And I said, what am I going to do with this? I thought I was going to choke. It was getting louder and louder. Finally, I opened my mouth and spoke it. And when I did, 
I felt myself leaving my body. I was somewhere with Jesus that I can't explain. I was born again. Yeah. I mean, I was completely changed. And I said to myself while it was going on, this is what it's like to die, to be changed, completely changed. And when I came to myself, so to speak, I was never the same again. Thank you, God. Never the same again. Everybody that knew me said, what has happened to you? Hmm. And then I found the scripture where Paul said, Christ in you, that's your hope of glory. If he comes to dwell in you, that's it's what it's all about. your hope of glory. Well, I wanted to tell it. I was as bad as my mother with an evangelism. As wonderful as your mother. I wanted to tell it. <laughs> and so I said, could I have a class of kids? And they gave me 60, oh 63 my young people, ages 12 to 15. They'd had a lot of problems with those kids. They wouldn't listen. They wouldn't be, it was bad. They need the word. So they all thought, well, let's see what she's going to do. <laughs> So I prayed and I went, and I taught those kids that first Sunday about what had happened to me. Not a person moved. And then I taught all about God's plan for salvation. That's beautiful. And how he could deliver, how he could heal, and how he could know that it's real. And about the Holy Spirit and the baptism in water, all of the things that God does for us. Mm -hmm. And by the time I was through, all 63 had had an experience with the Lord, been baptized in water, and filled with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Well, we confirmed them. The ministry confirmed them. <laughs> and the next year I had another class, and another class, and another class. And the parents said, our kids know more than we do. We want an adult class. Mm -hmm. So I began teaching adults. And I taught for 20 some years. So beautiful. And I knew I had to put something in a book so that my notes would be preserved and I could tell it. Mm -hmm. So I wrote the first book and it was published in 1972. And it grew, and it grew, and it grew. And then I knew it was time for change. And my husband and I took a trip to the island of Haiti. We had a friend that just pestered the life out of us about going. He went, his name was Herb Sweat. He wanted me to be in Haiti and teach the people there. So we said, well, finally, to get rid of him, <laughs> we'll go. take a trip. <laughs> so we took a trip. And what I saw in that country, I couldn't believe. I never smelled anything like that. Horrible, sour, Death. rotten, terrible. And little kids with big bellies and red hair are starving to death and the faces on women, what they had been through. I, I said, but what in the world can I do? There, this thing is enormous. There's nothing I could do. What would I do? Asking God. And the Lord said to me, well, you know, said the only thing I know is teaching and raising kids. <laughs> <laughs> and the Lord said, that's it. So I started with women and children. Oh, beautiful. And the ministry grew and grew and grew. I won't go into details because lack of time. And I knew we needed a Bible school. So we did. And I t trained young men, mostly young men, because women were not given that much of, of an audience. Four years, like a seminary, really, and put them in the fields. And then on day, the Lord made me to do, and it was needed to build a hospital. I knew that. 
I knew that before I'd ever gone to Haiti. I remember the day the Lord spoke to me and said, build a hospital in Haiti for the sick and the poor. It'll become a Shangri-La. And I said, my God, I don't know anything about medicine. How could I build a hospital? I don't know anything about building. And I told it in church, and they all thought I lost my mind. Mm. But I'd heard. Yes. It's a long story, and I know we don't have that much time. But the day came when the Minister of Health asked me to come to St. Mark, and there was another city, and meet with five doctors. There was one from the Doctors Without Borders, World Health Care. Um, well, there were, there were five of them. And they said, you've been here more than 12 years. We didn't want anybody to talk to if they hadn't been here at least 12 years, because people go and come, go and come. Got big ideas, but never go say anything. Yeah. We have a need. Women are giving birth to their babies in the fields, and neither one of them are, are living. We need to build a maternity hospital. And we're asking, if we built it, would you take care of it? I was shocked when I knew what the Lord had said to me. I said, what kind of a hospital? Well, you know what we build around here. I said, yeah, I know what you build around here. I'm not interested in that. If you'd build one like I want you to build, with electricity and running water and clean beds and everything that they need, yes, yes but other than that, no. No, they said, we can't do that. Well, then I said, I'm not interested. Now, wait a minute, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's talk a minute. <laughs> well, it ended up, they worked with us. And we built a hospital. And then we enlarged the hospital. And we're enlarging again. Incredible. And we're having babies born all the time. Healthy babies. And not one has died. Oh, thank you, God. And women are finding help. Yes. And we've got a hospital beyond that for just maternity care. We take care of men and children. And it's growing and growing and growing. Amazing. That's the story of Reba. Well, I'm getting up in years. I've still got my mind, still got my memory. I lack a little strength, but I fell a couple times, and that's, but the Lord's gonna only heal me, that I know. Yes. Anyway, yep. I said, Lord, my mother always said, if you don't have a successor, you weren't called. Oh because in this, there is continuance. Oh my. And I said, what am I gonna do? I didn't know it, but my son, Harry, yeah. was being talked to by God. And he'll all have to get his testimony from him, how he fought it and how God took care of it. <laughs> and he has come in as the next the president of Rima, and he's doing a wonderful job. Faithful. Yes. And I guess that's all I can say, other than I've done a lot of writing. With uh, having so many people to teach, I had to have a book called Understanding the Master's Voice. You got to be able to hear from God. Yes. And then I wrote Understanding Yourself. And then Understanding the Winds of God. You know, they're not all good winds. <laughs> they're good in God's sight, but some of them are pretty sharp and hurt. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were trans some of them were translated. Uh, understanding God, the first one, was uh, translated into Russian and uh, Spanish and French. Wow. And they have sold all over the world. Incredible. That's my story. Oh, my <laughs> heavens. That's a beautiful, that's so, so beautiful. I hope I haven't taken too much of your time. Oh, absolutely not, Sister no. Pat. It's so just that's, incredible. That's the, that's the story, Morning Glory. <laughs> How your mom picked that Bible up and God spoke to her heart. Yeah. And how she obeyed the yeah. Word of God. Well, when you really hear from God, yeah. there's no question. Yes. You know, oh, that's my. the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, there are people that won't obey. We all know that. That's too bad. 
because they miss the best. Oh. When was the last time you got to go to Haiti? Three years ago, I was attending my grandson's wedding. And I was walking with my daughter-in-law across the yard to go into the church. And I don't know how it happened, but I tripped and fell and broke my hip. Oh, dear. So while the wedding was going on, I was had in the ambulance going to the hospital. And from that day, I have had four falls altogether. And I get banged up pretty badly, but I don't lose my memory, mm -hmm. nor have I lost my spunk. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, and with each one, I knew more about the Lord. He, he and it's a, chance, it's a chance to talk to people in the nursing homes where they oh, send me yes. for recovery or in the hospital. Um, I'm not afraid to tell the story. It's such a wonderful story. Will you tell us a bit about your husband, um, J.P.? My husband, Gruens. Pete, was a wonderful man. Everybody loved Pete. Pete never saw a stranger. And uh, we worked together in Haiti. And we were going, we were home this particular time for uh, you get the things in the office done. You know, you, you have to be torn. You have to have a list of where you're going to go and who you're going to see and fundraising and whatever. Sure. <clears throat> so we had come home to take care of that for a month or so. And it was time to go back because it was time for graduation for the men that were gone, had gone through Hope Academy. And uh, we got in the car drove to the Miami airport, and we stood at the ticket counter with our passport and the ticket. And he looked funny. I said, what's wrong, Pete? He said, Pat, I'm dizzy. And with that, he fell dead on my feet. Oh, my. Just like that. Oh, dear. I went into shock. I said, how do you pray in tongues? I couldn't even remember. I couldn't remember anything. His funeral was great, but I don't remember the trip from Florida back to Michigan for the funeral. I blacked out. Mm -hmm. A funeral, people came from everywhere. Men say, came to me and said, did you know that your husband bought us a car? Did you know that your husband gave us groceries? Did you know this? Did you know that? Well, some of it I did. But he had friends, friends, friends. So beautiful. And my boys all look like him. Both of your sons that I met look like each other. Yeah. And, and I did see the video, and they do, yeah, um, they do look like their father. Yeah, Pete and I were married 15th of June in 1946. And... Uh, it's a long story. <laughs> Such a full, beautiful life yeah. lived out yeah. for God. Yeah. Sister, We've had, we had our ups and we had our downs. Mm -hmm. And through it all, you learn more about God. Yes. He never promised us a rose garden. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, Sister Pat, this has been a beautiful time. I'm so thankful that you could be here today. I'm going to have to have you back. Well, because I you will, have more I to will, share. I will if I can, honey. Yes, I'd be thank glad to you. do that. Thank you so much, dear lady. And thank you for asking me. Uh -huh. Thank you. I hope that you have enjoyed this time together with um, precious Pat Patricia Gruitz, Sister Pat. I know she's touched your heart. You have a blessed day. Bye. <laughs>